there's this category of, uh, of water technology that I only became familiar with because you started telling me about it almost a decade ago called atmospheric water generation, AWG. And at the time I could find no companies that were really uh, building anything or talking about it at scale. Can you help, help me understand what is atmospheric water generation and why is it only now uh, reaching pilot and sort of project scale? Similar to energy that you and your viewers know so well, there's a lot of different technologies in energy, right? Whether it's solar, wind, nuclear, you know, hydro, et cetera, et cetera. In water, there's also many, many different ways to uh, generate, prepare, and provide water. Of those various different ways, one of the newest and most innovative ways is what's referred to as atmospheric water generation, or AWG. AWG is different than any and all the other water technologies, which are mostly in different forms of reverse or forward osmosis, basically filtering water or also dis distillation. Atmospheric water generation is different because our resource is the air. So all the other technologies need to have an existing body of water, like a lake, a river, an ocean, you know, to desalinate, where in our case, the resource is the air. And air is everywhere. And that makes AWG able to have kind of game-changing business models because we can now build and locate AWG facilities at or near where the water is being used and consumed. And one of the big challenges, just like in energy, is how to get that resource from where it's being generated, you know, along a transmission or distribution line to where it's being used. Right. And building infrastructure like that, just like transmission or distribution lines and energy, is highly expensive, takes a long time, uh, very challenging. So as we can make water generating facilities at near where it's being needed, let's say like at a hospital, you know, at some kind of mission critical facility, that's game changing. For those who are totally unfamiliar like myself, what is the relevant uh, composition of water in the air and you're in a typical like, like Houston, which is more, I would assume because it's more humid it literally means that it has more water in the air uh can you give us a, a quick you know 101 on how that how we should think about that so atmospheric water generation similar to solar energy or wind energy is uh, a renewable resource it's renewable water like those are renewable energy and the resource the natural resource required to do well is relative humidity. There's other factors too, like temperature and elevation and so forth. But the key driver is relative humidity. Just like for solar, the key driver is insulation. The better the insulation, the more you know kilowatts you're going to make. Well, in the case of AWG, for the most part, the higher the relative humidity, the more water you can squeeze out of the air. Atmospheric water generation, the way it works is um, simple to understand, hard to do. So basically what we do is we have these uh, large machines at SkyTrue, we are industrial scale, we call them the AWG Maximus. And almost like a vacuum cleaner, we suck in huge amounts of air. That air is then fil filtered, we've got a three level filtration uh, setup, almost like a clean room. And what comes into the machine is uh, essentially highly filtered, purified air that then gets compressed. So like when you look up in the sky and you see an airplane flying, that's a water stripe of compressed air. And then we take uh, that compressed air and we, we run it through a device that we call a coolerator. It's basically kind of like a radiator with fins and we lower the temperature of that water to the dew point actually below the dew point. So when you, let's say, uh, you know, are enjoying a nice cold beer 
and the side of the glass is all filled with water, that's coming from the outside atmosphere, the water in the air. Oh, yeah. Right? So that's mm -hmm. essentially the resource. And uh, we're basically moving a lot, tons of air, if you will, through the machine, and that then converts and the water comes out. And what comes out of the machine at the first level is essentially uh, purified, distilled-like water. There's nothing in it. It's highly pure. And then depending on how the water is being used, it can then be used uh, more or less like uh, purified water for industrial purposes. I mean, just for an example, solar companies should love this because most of these solar farms have big challenges washing and cleaning panels, and they really want to have distilled like water so they don't, so they don't, you know, spot and uh, leave minerals. Leave minerals. So this uh, fuel distilled like water through AWG is very valuable to them. But in most cases, the water is most valuable for personal consumption, which would be drinking water, water used for food and cooking, maybe, you know, personal hygiene, brushing your teeth and so forth. That's where this water is mostly used for. And that's what the projects in Texas are designed for. You stated that over 45% of the U.S. water is estimated to be toxic. Where are you pulling the data from? And how can we validate um, that? I mean, that for me is a really startling statistic. I'm just curious where the information is coming from and what are the relevant toxicity markers that we should be concerned about um, and that, that, that through AWG we can eliminate? Uh, so that's a, uh, that 45% statistic <clears throat> is a, a public report. It's now a public report made by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency just last year in 2023. So I don't know if you can get more uh -huh. credible than that. That I would I would say that's well. Some it, people might call EPA into question, but for the purposes of our audience and my liking, the EPA is a credible resource. There's many different fuel toxins found in the water, you know, from plastics to pharmaceuticals, you know, to all kinds of different stuff. What's becoming most talked about, kind of most notorious, are the the PFAS that are referred to as forever chemicals. Uh, the reason they're called forever chemicals because these are Frankenstein elements that honestly nobody has figured out yet how to eliminate. There's tons of investment current, currently going into industries to try to figure out how to eliminate uh, PFAS, things like Teflon, but not even you know the most sophisticated filtration systems can get can get them out. So they're coming out of your faucet. In the case of the Houston area. You can look this up. You'll find as many as 49 different toxins in the water. Right. The toxicity in the water that ultimately comes out of your tap, there's a number of fail points. So the first is the original water source. The second is uh, the water as the process coming out of the water treatment plant. So a lot of these treatment plants are old and not effective. The third is the water going down the pipelines. Across America, most of our infrastructure is old and decrepit. There's a lot of lead pipes, a lot of rust that gets into the water. And fourth, before it comes out of your tap, it's going through your plumbing. And most people's homes or apartment buildings, they're old and cruddy. So there's just so many places for it to fail before you start drinking it. 